Hello, and welcome to this Institution of Mechanical Engineers webinar on advanced analysis and the durability assessment of piping systems susceptible to flow-induced vibration. I'm Simon Rees, the IMECI Upstream Oil and Gas Committee, and I'll be posing questions to our speaker after the presentation is finished today. To ask a question, please type it into the panel in front of you at any time during the presentation. I'll read out as many as I can in the time we have, although I may combine some similar questions into one. One common question is, will there be a recording of this made available? And yes, there will be. There'll be one available on the IMECI YouTube channel in a few days' time. Our speaker today is Dr. Bruce Kakimpa. Bruce is a principal engineer at Norton Straw Consultants with over 10 years experience in applying CFD and FEA methods to engineering challenges across subsea, oil and gas, process and aerospace sectors. His specialism is in the application of simulation-driven engineering analysis to multi-physics problems involving fluid flow, multiphase, heat transfer, fluid structure interaction, and vibration. He holds a PhD in computational fluid mechanics from the University of Nottingham and is a chartered member of the Institution of Mechanical Engineers. Thank you, Simon, and thanks for everyone joining us today for this webinar. To start with, I'll give a brief introduction of who we are. Norton Stroll. It's a diverse team of engineering and technology specialists delivering consultancy services across a range of industries. We typically help our clients in one of three ways. We provide innovation and new method development, helping our clients find new ways of assessing their systems. We also provide engineering design support services. This includes the use of simulation in both thermal, fluid and structural systems to uh, verify design performance and also to ensure the integrity and durability of systems and finally we also provide in-service and operational support to our clients and this includes fitness for service assessments as well as operational troubleshooting. We work across a range of sectors spanning from oil and gas where we have our traditional routes and increasingly more into the energy and power sector the transportation sector, which covers uh, rail, automotive and aerospace activities, built environment, as well as the chemical process and food industries. You're welcome to visit our recently revamped website where you can find out more details and also view some very interesting case studies that cover some of our previous work. My aim today is to explore the role that advanced analysis has to play in the durability assessment of piping systems that are susceptible to flow induced vibration. So I will start my talk with an introduction of FIV and some of the key terminology used. Then I will outline why FIV is a problem in process piping before then giving a summary overview of the available industry approaches for tackling this problem. As I do this, I hope to highlight how simulation fits into the broader framework as a valuable addition to the FIV risk assessment toolkit and to close uh, or to wrap up, I will then present three case studies with which I will demonstrate how we at Northern Straw have used advanced analysis to facilitate the FIV risk assessment of some complex real world uh, process piping systems. So what is FIV and why is it important? Flow induced vibration or FIV in simple terms refers to any vibration of a structural system that is driven by fluctuating fluid forces acting on the structure. The animation on the top uh, shown here illustrates a velocity, a fluctuating velocity distribution in a turbulent fluid flow. And you can imagine that as these velocity fluctuations travel through the system, they induce on the walls of the piping uh, pressure and shear stress fluctuations. And if these force fluctuations are large enough and uh, frequencies that are close enough to the natural frequency of the structure, they can then induce some high amplitude structural vibrations. Now, different mechanisms, fluid mechanisms, can generate fluid force fluctuations. And this then leads to different types of uh, FIV, as we shall explore later. Now, the main reason that flow induced vibration is a concern is that it can typically lead to fatigue failure of process piping posing safety, environmental, and commercial risks. The image on the right of the slide here is a statistical summary of the recorded offshore hydrocarbon releases 
in the UK from 2001 to 2008 uh, in terms of causes as reported by the HSE. The key thing to note is that vibration and fatigue in particular accounted for 21%, which is a substantial proportion of the observed failures. Another interesting thing to note from this was that it was recorded that a key issue was inadequate design, where vibratory service was not well accounted for, leading to insufficient fatigue strength of the system. This highlights that accurately assessing the risk of flow in this vibration in the design process or during changes to operational conditions is very important to ensuring the safety and reliability of a process facility. Generally speaking, fluid-related mechanisms can be broadly categorized into two categories. We have acoustic-induced vibration and flow-induced vibration. The key distinction is in the active frequency range of the excitation generated. In the high frequency range, typically spanning from 500 hertz to the tens of kilohertz, we have what is known as acoustic-induced vibration or AIV. AIV is generated by the high frequency pressure waves that occur in pressure reducing devices such as relief or control valves. This typically manifests as shell mode type vibrations as illustrated in the animations in the top left showing acoustic wave propagation and the accompanying shell mode type vibrations. This kind of vibration is typically low amplitude and not visible to the uh, human eye. On the other hand, we have in the low frequency range typically spanning uh, 100 to 200 hertz or less uh, what is commonly referred to as flow in this vibration fiv is usually associated with b mode type vibrations unlike aiv and these are typically higher amplitude uh, often visible to the human eye and low frequency fiv can be driven by a range of different flow mechanisms each different mechanism gives rise to a different subcategory of FIV. For instance, we could have turbulence in this vibration, which is driven by the turbulent flow fluctuations in a very high speed flow. We could also have uh, what is known as multi-phase induced vibration, and this is driven by the unsteady gas-liquid mixture flows uh, and their momentum exchange, which generates significant uh, force fluctuations at the bends where slugs of uh, liquid intermittently impinge on the bends. And we could also have what's known as flow induced delayed pulsation, which is another example of an FIV mechanism. And this typically occurs when you have a high speed flow in a main line going past the dead leg. Uh, when flow separation occurs at the entrance of the dead leg, you can generate vortices at the entrance and these create a pulsation. If the frequency of this pulsation is uh, close to the acoustic natural frequency of the dead leg, you can then create a standing wave and amplify that pulsation leading to significant vibration. For today we will focus on FIV and uh, although some of the workflows we'll discuss for pressure pulsation have been successfully applied to AIV problems, we will not directly address uh, AIV in this webinar. So currently there are a range of uh, FIV assessment approaches available to engineers in industry. The traditional go-to first approach is to look at available best practice guidelines such as the Energy Institute guidelines for the avoidance of vibration induced fatigue failure in process pipeline. Now what these guidelines do is they stipulate design criteria and operational best practices and they're based on accumulated experience as well as uh, semi-empirical models for predicting the risk of uh, failure for a given system. They're typically intended to uh, be applied in a generalized format so they often uh, refer to fairly simple uh, piping layer geometries but they can be applied to both uh, new designs and operational designs and um, um, they can also 
uh, I guess the, the biggest benefit is that they're quick and simple. And, and what this allows is for engineers to basically carry out uh, a very quick sweep of an entire facilities process piping and then flag where the key uh, high risk issues are. Some of the limitations are that they can be quite conservative and overly constrained design. Uh, they can be limited in terms of the kind of geometries and also the kind of mechanisms that you can um, evaluate with them. Indeed, some mechanisms such as uh, multi-phase induced vibration risk are not adequately covered by the guidelines. So the question is uh, what to do where screening guidelines have a very clear limitation of scope or where uh, screening guidelines have uh, sort of flagged an unacceptably high risk or failure, even though we know that they can be quite conservative in their risk assessments. So in this case, engineers have uh, one of two routes. First, they could consider a test and monitoring approach where you operate the system, but then you regularly test and also instrument it with uh, vibration measurement devices. And this is often feasible for um, systems already in operation, but is uh, often uh, not the preferred route for new system designs. And and also, um, although testing and monitoring can tell you when you have an issue and possibly quantify the vibration amplitude you're seeing, it doesn't quite give you enough insight into the problem to be able to uh, evaluate what an appropriate solution to the problem would be. And in this context, uh, engineering simulation uh, presents itself as a very valuable addition to the FIV toolkit. And um, with simulation, what we can do is that uh, both the design stage and also in the evaluation of risks to in-service systems, we can um, assess quite extreme operating conditions relatively cheaply and also look at complex geometries and complex flow mechanisms where screening guidelines are not always appropriate. Uh, simulation also provides a much greater depth of insight than say, uh, the test and monitoring approach, uh, both into the mechanism and also the nature of the response. And this can be useful in informing the uh, design uh, of effective solutions to the vibration problem. So next we will look at what simulation-based workflow for an FIV durability assessment looks like. This simulation workflow can be broken down into a series of steps. The first step is to quantify the vibration driving force. This typically involves using tools such as computational fluid dynamics or acoustic finite element analysis to explicitly predict the driving mechanisms and quantify the driving forces that would generate the vibration. Once we have these driving forces, we can then apply them to a structural model of the system and use this structure model to predict the forced response and the steady state vibration of the system. Uh, this allows us to extract the uh, vibration amplitudes as well as the dynamic stress ranges that would occur as a result of the, of the uh, uh, excitation mechanism being simulated. The dynamic stress output is then used in a durability assessment. Uh, together with material and wheel fatigue curves, we can then estimate the fatigue life of the system. The predicted life is then evaluated against some durability criteria. This typically includes uh, a design fatigue factor, which uh, takes into account um, the uncertainties in the fatigue life estimation process. Uh, this could typically be derived from industry guidelines as well as uh, taking into account operator experience and operator guidance as well as the analyst judgment. If the durability criteria is not met, however, then simulation provides a unique opportunity to explore other options using the very same multi-physics models that have already been built to carry out the durability assessment. Now, this exploration could follow one of two pathways. 
first we could use the models to explore feasible modifications to the operating conditions. This includes things like changing flow rates, operating pressures, uh, flow velocities, in order to uh, reduce the magnitude of the dynamic forces that are generated. Uh, and this can be iterated until we determine what operational changes from a range of feasible options would meet the target durability requirement. However, this is not always possible. And in this case, uh, an alternative route is to explore modifications to the structural system itself. Uh, this includes exploration of uh, alternative piping layouts, so alternative supports, uh, modifications to the piping stiffness, as well as uh, uh, improvements to weld specifications, all of which uh, are intended at improving the durability of the system. At the end of the process, the workflow allows us to determine whether our current system meets the durability requirement, but also to have an accurate uh, or reliable picture of what visible changes to the operating conditions or to the structural configuration would allow us to meet those uh, durability requirements. In this part of the webinar, I will now use a series of case studies to demonstrate how we've used simulation based workflows to address FIV risk assessment challenges. I will present three different mechanisms. In each mechanism, I will highlight why a simulation based workflow was deemed to be necessary, how it was applied and what value it added and what the outcome of the study was. The first case study, we look at flow-induced turbulence as a problem in a subsea production system. This work for this case study is discussed in full detail in a recently, recently published OMC paper at the uh, reference shown below for those who would like to see it in more detail. The system in question was a subsea flow spool and its supporting structure as shown here in green. The spool emerged from the tree and connected to a subsea jumper and was supported by this green cylindrical shell known as a receiver bucket. The system was in service with no known issues. However, the operator had the opportunity for the subsea well to produce at a rate that was 24% higher than the design flow rate. As part of the feasibility study for the operational condition change, an FIV risk assessment was carried out. Uh, this used EIA screening tools and identified a high risk of turbulence induced vibration in the flow spool section, shown here in red. One particular issue with assessing this spool, however, was the uncertainty in the uh, characterization of the support condition at the receiver bucket. In line with guidelines, a recommendation for more detailed assessment was, was, was implemented. A particular challenge in using screening guidelines on this system as described was that although these guidelines uh, tend to be derived from fairly simplistic piping representations where you have complex supporting structures, they can sometimes be uh, inappropriate as a, a description of the system being assessed. So in this instance, we've used coupled CFD and FEA structure simulations to assess the uh, fatigue life of the structure at the new flow condition and determine whether it satisfied the target durability requirements. In line with the simulation based workflow outlined previously, the first step in the analysis was to build a computational fluid dynamics or CFD model of the spool, including upstream piping sections such as the choke valve and upstream piping as well as uh, sections of downstream piping. This safety model was used to predict the turbulent unsteady fluid flow through the spool and the associated dynamic forcing this generated. We see in the top uh, left image here an animation of the unsteady turbulent velocity field through the spool. The flow coming out of the chalk generates a large scale cyclonic vortex that breaks up as it 
flows downwards and impinges on the blind tea and the flow and steadiness then also induces uh, large scale uh, tablet structures at the entrance to the spool which break up as they propagate down the spool to accurately capture these effects we used scale resolving turbulence models where the large energy containing eddies are explicitly simulated uh, and these are the primary drivers of the force fluctuations that we see on the bottom left we see an animation that gives us the resulting unsteady pressure fluctuations on the walls of the spool which represent the forcing function generated. The dynamic forces were extracted from the spool and applied to a structural FE model of the spool and receiver bucket. As the system was in service and redesign of critical locations was not an option, the goal here was to basically use the forces to carry out a forced response analysis of the system obtain the vibration and dynamic stress response of the system to the applied forces and then therefore assess these critical locations such as the uh, uh, stiffener rib weld locations on the receiver bucket where we saw fairly large uh, amplitude dynamic uh, stress cycling and, and work out whether the durability requirements were satisfied at these locations so the dynamic stresses in the FA model were then carried through to a durability assessment in order, in order to facilitate this. We then carried out the durability assessment at all world locations and found that actually the target durability requirements were met and that the uh, spool and receiver bucket could be successfully operated at the higher flow rate condition. And this is shown here illustrated with a a map showing in green areas where the criteria has been met and the prediction was that we would see no significant damage in the fired material uh, and that fatigue life at world locations would be uh, satisfied at the assessed conditions. So to recap uh, what we learned from this case study we see that um, we started off with the screening guidelines uh, together with some simplifying assumptions about support conditions identifying a high risk of fatigue failure due to flow induced turbulence in the spool. Using CFD simulations, we're able to quantify the driving force and extract the vibration, uh, the, the forcing function this uh, the turbulence flow generated. And this was applied to the structure and uh, used to simulate the vibration response of the system and extract the uh, dynamic stresses that resulted from this. Uh, finally, a durability assessment was carried out and the uh, spool and receiver bucket were found to meet the target durability criteria at the higher flow rate condition and the system could be safely operated. And this is an example where a simulation based workflow was actually able to qualify a system where the AI guidelines were uh, very conservative and suggested that uh, an unacceptably high level of risk existed whereas in reality the risk was more a function of uh, the conservatism in the uh, definition of structural configurations and also estimation of FIP forcing. The second case study I will now show relates to a multi-phase flow in a subsea jumper system. The jumper is an M-shaped pipeline. Uh, this is illustrated here in this top right hand image. And this can be typically of the order of about 40 meter long in terms of span length. The jumper is used to convey a multi-phase gas liquid mixture at a very high speed from a subsea tree all the way to a subsea manifold. Now, preliminary regime calculations suggested that slug or churn flow was a possibility. To explain this briefly, uh, in piping systems we, with gas and liquid flows, a number of possible flow regimes may occur, as illustrated in this bottom uh, right-hand image. And this could range from uh, bubbly flows, 
uh, on the right here where you have a relatively small gas content and a high liquid content through to slug flows where you get intermittent and fairly regular frequencies of uh, gas slugs followed by liquid slugs um, as the uh, gas content decreases this can then become churned where you have slugs but they're relatively more broken up and more irregular in frequency compared to churn flow to cook sorry compared to slug flow and ultimately um, ending up in uh, annular and mist type flows at very high gas gas flow rates now in FIV terms it tends to be the uh, FIV slug and churn flow conditions that are of concern uh, as you imagine as these slugs which are large li liquid volumes followed by large gas volumes intermittently slam into pipe vents and teeth they can generate quite some high amplitude forcing fluctuations at these elements one challenge however in trying to predict the actual flow regime in some complex piping systems such as the subsea jump places that most empirical correlations for flow regime are derived from fairly uh, simple straight uh, pipelines and so uh, when you have a series of bends and short and long spans it becomes quite difficult to reliably estimate what kind of flow regime you will actually have in addition another constraint to assessing multiphase induced vibration here was that the ES creating guidelines do not appropriately address multiphase FIV risk Instead, they recommend that specialist analysis is uh, obtained and advanced analysis methods be considered in these circumstances. So this was an example of a situation where, uh, although commonly encountered, is quite outside the scope of the current EI screening guidelines in terms of actually quantifying the FIV risk. So to assess the FIV risk of the system, we used a simulation to predict the multiphase flow regime through the complex geometry to quantify the vibration the, the dynamic processes generates the vibration that results and ultimately to predict the fatigue lives at critical world locations in the jumper for this multiphase induced vibration case we used a similar sequential couple cfd fe workflow as was used in the first case uh, the first step is to use CFD simulations using volume fluid method in this case to predict the multiphase gas liquid dynamics within the jumper and extract the dynamic forcing. The animation at the bottom here shows uh, transient gas liquid flow profiles through the jumper and a time trace of the dynamic forcing generated at one of the jumper vents. This dynamic forcing is then extracted from all the jumper bends and straight sections in a CFD model and mapped onto a finite element structural model of the jumper. This finite element structural model is then used to carry out a transient forced response analysis of the jumper under the imposed loading due to the multiphase flow. And this um, allows us to basically obtain the steady state vibration and dynamic stress response. Uh, at the bottom, is an animation of a scale deformation showing the vibration response of the jumper to the FIV loading and also a uh, sample time trace of the uh, von Mises uh, stress at one of the uh, critical locations. So by extracting the dynamic stresses at all the critical locations which would uh, in this case be the world locations where we expect the limiting fatigue layer to occur we are then able to carry out a fatigue analysis of the system. So in this case, we were able to show that the fatigue life was in excess of the uh, minimum fatigue life requirement for the system. So in summary, um, we can say that this case study covering my first flow illustrates where a case where there is no clear FIV screening approach available for a number of complex, complex reasons to do with the complexities of flow regime prediction and complex geometry and also the absence of uh, reliable simplified models for FIV forcing in, in these complex piping systems. So the case study however clearly shows how a simulation offers a route to quantifying FIV risk in these complex uh, flow and complex geometry systems
that are beyond the scope of existing guidelines. In this final case study, I will look uh, at the interesting problem of flow induced dead leg pulsation and uh, we'll describe this mechanism and how it emerges and look at a specific case where uh, there were limitations in using existing guidelines to actually address the risk presented by this mechanism and how simulation was able to provide a, an alternative route to qualify the system. The system in question had to do with uh, a high-speed turbulence flow of a gas uh, past a non-straight dead leg in a process system. We see at the bottom right here an illustration of, an illustration of the system. So we have a high-speed gas flow coming down from an upstream system of complex piping and control valves down into a T and then out into a horizontal section just adjacent immediately adjacent to the T is a opening an opening to a, a dead leg that is a non-straight geometry now the nature of the upstream piping and the proximity of the dead leg entrance to a blind T meant that a combination of possible pulsation sources were present Due to both the high speed flow separation of the mouth of the dead leg, as illustrated in the top right image, which is a possible mechanism, a vortex can be generated and this can lead to uh, pressure pulsation at the entrance of the dead leg simply because of a high speed flow going past it. In addition, however, the nearby blind T is also expected to create large and unsteady flow structures that could also generate significant pulsation at the entrance of the dead leg by themselves. If these pulsation sources are at frequencies close to the structural natural frequencies, then, uh, sorry, close to the acoustic natural frequencies of the cavity uh, of the dead leg, then acoustic resonance could occur in the dead leg, and this could then lead to high amplitude. Uh, pressure fluctuations as the pulsations get amplified. Um, if this amplified pressure fluctuations then also happen to occur at a frequency that's close to a nearby structure mode, then you could have what's known as a resonant fibroacoustic response, where the structure of the dead leg then responds to the amplified pulsation uh, leading to uh, uh, devastating consequences. The EIS skin screening approach in these situations typically seeks to check for acoustic resonance. So it will check the natural frequencies of the dead leg, try and estimate the uh, frequency at which uh, flow separation and vortex shading happen to the entrance of the dead leg, and then um, use those two to basically work out a, a likelihood of, vibe, of, of acoustic resonance occurring. Um, However, the complication with in this specific case was that the EA screening guidelines are not applicable to non-straight dead legs. Uh, and when trying to sort of approximate this as a straight dead leg, nonetheless the calculation did still reveal that there was a high risk of dead leg uh, induced pulsation occurring. So this was a fast flag and, and a fast requirement that sort of generated the need for a different approach um, and also the the added complexity of having a secondary pulsation source possibly present from a nearby upstream T also meant that the EA screening approach was no longer appropriate for this problem so advanced analysis was recommended in this situation and uh, the first step of this was to use CFT simulation to predict the turbulent flow structures in the main line and the pressure fluctuations that we generate at the entrance of the dead leg. Here at the bottom right, at the bottom left, sorry, we see uh, contours of velocity and pressure illustrating the two uh, possible mechanisms of interest. In the first image on the left, we see a large and steady separation bubble at the entrance of the T and this would be intermittently shed uh, of what as, as vortices into the main line 
In addition, in the second image on the left, we also see that there is uh, a separation bubble associated with a uh, flow separation at the entrance of the dead leg. And this would also then be expected to contribute to pressure pulsation at the entrance of the dead leg. By extracting and processing the pressure generated at the inlet of the dead leg, uh, we were able to obtain a description of the pulsation spectra generated at the dead leg as a result of a combination of these two mechanisms. And this is shown here in the uh, pressure pulsation time series and the spectra uh, illustrated there in this image. So using this, we're able to demonstrate that CFD can be used in these complex uh, flow geometry conditions to reliably uh, predict or characterize the uh, nature of the uh, dead leg entrance excitation. Now, because of the broadband nature of the CFD excitation spectra, resonance avoidance was not a feasible strategy for this problem. So we needed to be able to predict the structure response of the system to the uh, acoustic excitation at the dead leg entrance and uh, from that, be able to calculate the fatigue life and assess the system durability. To do this, we started off by developing a coupled vibroacoustic finite element model, where we couple an acoustic finite element model of the internal fluid cavity in the dead leg to a structural finite element model of the dead leg uh, structural components themselves. This allows us to predict the structural frequency response function of the dead leg, which is basically a function that gives us the stress and vibration response of the dead leg to a unit acoustic excitation uh, at the entrance to the dead leg. And we do a harmonic sweep of this unit excitation across a given frequency range. And at each frequency band in that range, we can obtain a representation of the expected um, normalized stress response of the um, of, of, of the dead leg to that excitation. To get the steady state vibration response and estimate the durability of the system, we then followed a frequency domain uh, FEA and fatigue assessment approach. To do this, we started off with the excitation spectra extracted from the CFD, which uh, defines our excitation forcing in this case, and also obtained a frequency response function using the fiberacoustic FEA model, which in this case describes uh, a function that maps from the uh, dead leg excitation onto structure response. By scaling this frequency response function by the excitation spectra, we're able to obtain a steady state stress response spectra at various critical locations within the uh, dead leg. This stress response spectra is then used together with frequency domain cycle counting approaches such as the Dalek method to estimate the rain flow histogram, which is the statistical distribution of uh, stress ranges at any given location, and together with the uh, world SN curves, we are able to then uh, quantify the fatigue life of the system and thereby assess whether it's uh, sufficient to meet the durability requirements. The conclusion of this study was having started out with a complex dead leg geometry with some fairly complex pulsation generation mechanisms both of which were beyond the scope of the screening guidelines. Advanced analysis uh, was shown to be a uh, valuable route in the sense that simulation was could successfully be used to not only characterize a pulsation spectra, but also to predict the consequences in terms of vibration and fatigue. Thank you for staying with me to the end of this webinar. And as I conclude, I would like to recap on some of the main points. The first main point is that we have seen how FIV is a critical factor in the safety and reliability of process systems. As a result, FIV should be adequately allowed for in the design and operation of the systems in order to ensure uh, they can be safely and reliably operated.
we have also seen how existing FIB screening guidelines are a useful starting point. They offer a quick and easy route to identify areas in need of further assessment. However, we also saw how they can be overly conservative and thereby constrain design and operation and also how they can be applicable to certain specific cases where we encounter complex mechanisms or complex geometries that are not uh, adequately covered, with, covered within the, uh, guide, the scope of the guidelines. In these uh, situations where the uh, screening either suggests that risks are unacceptably high or where the complex mechanisms are, are not adequately accounted for, um, we've seen how multiphysics simulations are a valuable addition to the FIV risk assessment toolkit. Uh, with the aid of some case studies, I've hopefully demonstrated how uh, I don't know we've been using simulation to provide a better understanding of uh, the nature of some of these complex FIV excitation mechanisms and also providing a route to the uh, durability assessment of the systems. And with that, I would like to conclude today's presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope you found it both interesting and informative and that it has stimulated some thought. I look forward to your questions and comments. And with that, I'd like to hand over to Simon Rees for the Q&A session. Well, thank you, Bruce. That was uh, that's quite incredible uh, selection of uh, amount of information there. Thank you very much to uh, to everyone who submitted questions. We have an awful lot of questions here. Uh, I will try my very best to go through them and, uh, and address as many as we can in the time we've got available. Um, first question, Bruce. Validation is always a big issue when you have complex modeling situations like this. How has the validation been handled for this type of analysis? Okay. Uh, hi, hi, Simon. Uh, thanks for that. Um, so validation is indeed an important question when it comes to using numerical simulation to sort of qualify the systems. From uh, the certainly from the multi-phase point of view, there is a joint industry project that was run to uh, sort of collect experimental data and also provide some guidance on best practices for modeling multi-phase flows, which can be quite uh, a complex thing to predict. So we generally run benchmarks against some of these data sets and also take some of the guidance on board. Uh, I think there was a comment to in, in one of the questions, I think, which sort of touched on this and some of the guidance from these JIP projects will possibly make it into future versions of of the guidance and we generally take uh, all these data sets, effectively benchmark the approach against them and based on, you know, the, uh, I guess, the, 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 the accuracy of the match, we, we draw a judgment as to, you know, what appropriate sort of design fatigue factors need to be used to, to make uh, support decisions using these analysis. Mm -hmm. So has, has that has actually been yeah. validated again? So we, we, and that stands up. For, and um, another question that yeah. is kind of lost, and I have I have got a lot of questions here. So uh, forgive me uh, if you're listening and I don't get round to it. Um, but I, I will try and capture as much as humanly possible. Um, the code assessment process and how it relates to design and assessment codes is something that various people have asked. Which codes? are you using and how do you actually take the process through to, to a code assessment? Okay, so in this case, for many of these cases, what, what we're doing is, you know, predicting a forcing function, predicting a response, and then going ahead to predict a, a, a fatigue life. Uh, so in doing the fatigue life assessment, we, yeah, we use uh, design codes, uh, whether it's the uh, DNV, uh, C203 or BS7608, and we'll take uh, appropriate, you know, sort of wells or material classifications. And we then typically then also add on top of that any additional considerations such as 
our service, uh, applying appropriate knockdown factors. And as, as I saw outlined, we, together with the operator and with the recommendations of, you know, the industry standards, we then make a judgment as to what an appropriate design fatigue factor would be uh, for, for the analysis. So it's a combination of, of analysis, but yeah, we do draw uh, durability curves from existing standards. So it is ultimately based on conventional design standards, the the, uh, the assessment of the integrity of the line. Uh, a question about AIV. Uh, yes. um, how about AIV assessment? How would AIV be done? And um, how about low density liquids such as hydrogen in a gas flow where AIV might exist? How, how could the process be used to model that? Uh, yes, so I think yeah, I saw the question here. Yeah, within a gas flow, you can have both FIV if the gas flow is very high speed, or if you have uh, you know pressure reducing valves with a high differential pressure, you can also then have an AIV problem. Uh, we have uh, also used uh, similar methodologies to assess AIV uh, in, in more from the point of view of trying to predict. Um, what kind of uh, strain responses you get at things like dead leg welds and, and also um, how various modifications, things like stiffening, uh, uh, stiffening rings can be used to improve that. So the methodology is applicable to AIV. With AIV, we typically deal with a much higher frequency range though, so we do take the frequency domain approach that I, I outlined. And um, there are certain differences as well in, in things like meshing, but uh, to make sure you capture like the shear mode responses, but but it, it is certainly applicable uh, to assessing the AV. Uh, um, a, a practical question that has cropped up a number of times. Um, oh, sorry, follow on to that. How about hydrogen? So it could work with hydrogen as well as with any other form of gas. Uh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The same approach. Uh, a practical question that's cropped up a number of times. What does the acronym DFF stand for? Okay, so yeah, so DFF is design fatigue factor, and that's really just a factor we use to account for the fact that uh, you know all, all models you know are are wrong. There's no model that's absolutely perfect. So it's a question of after having produced the model, do we understand the sort of level of uncertainty? of the model predictions and therefore uh, ha ha having a good understanding of that uh, can we then um, basically arrive at a, a fatigue factor, a, design, a safety factor to basically attach to that to, to make sure that you're still sufficiently conservative to bound um, uh, the upper limits of your uncertainty. So how is that factor calculated? So we, some of the, you know, design codes like the DMV have uh, a uh, uh, guidance on design factors based on how critical component is and how accessible it is for, uh, for maintenance. Uh, but also if you take into account uh, your known uncertainties on say your FIV post predictions based compared to say experimental measurements using benchmarks. And we've also in the back also taken into account different operator experiences. Uh, we then basically find ways of, of um, adjusting those design fatigue factors to possibly capture uh, all, all, all the existing experience and, and, and understanding around the problem. So it's, it's a balance of code guidance, operator judgment, and analyst judgment, basically, uh, once we understand um, what the end on the validated uh, benchmarks is. Okay, now we've got a number of questions about the uh, the Energy Institute guidelines. Uh, first question, were you involved or have access to the, the JIP that developed those, those guidelines a few years ago? Uh, no, we're not involved in the uh, guidelines. Uh, we are aware of a GIP and we have uh, actually drawn a lot from the data sets that were in the GIP in terms of trying to really benchmark in particular multi-phase FIV approaches and make sure that we were sort of um, 
at getting to a good level of confidence in terms of being able to predict uh, experimental observations. Um, we, uh, yeah, I, I think we hope that some of, of those things will make it into future versions of, of the guidance. And we're also aware of other work still ongoing. We are involved in the uh, multi-phase FIB special interest group around that. That's a continuation from the JIB. And there's also a number of other academic projects that are trying to look at things like reduced order models and, and forcing models for FIV force that um, should ultimately, hopefully, provide a sort of more clarity around, around FIV forcing and uh, a level of level of risk of failure. Okay. And uh, you mentioned that there were aspects of the, the code, the, the AI code, that are, that are uh, conservative. Could you be more specific about which bits are conservative within that? Okay, so that, that's the specific case that uh, I'm pushing up. So, as you mentioned, uh, we're looking at the first. First. Hello. Yes. Can you hear me? Your, your sound is really breaking up very badly. Um, I'm struggling to hear you. I think my sound's okay. So I, I, I don't know whether your microphone is coming adrift. Or something. Okay, sorry. Can you hear me now? Is that better? Hello? It's a little bit better. Yes, that, that's much better. Yes, sorry. You were saying about the okay. um, con conservatism within the code. Yes. Uh, so th that specific case we looked at, uh, in which was the, the spool. The, the code will generally predict um, sort of your flow kinetic energy. Now, because that spool was adjacent to a, uh, a high turbulent kinetic energy device, firstly, there was a high risk, even though we, we actually found that the turbulence generated was decaying quite rapidly. And so by the time you got to the, 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 the bend of the spool, it had decayed quite substantially, even though uh, the guidelines couldn't capture that. But the, the other issue as well was that um, in terms of support configuration, the, the kind of stiffness of the support was quite hard to account for when, when carrying out the AI assessment. So the initial assessment had taken a conservative approach around you know, support stiffness, and this had resulted in a, a high risk uh, uh, classification. So the only way to really remove that was to actually do something more detailed around that, and then that's why we then went down the analysis route. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah. Now, uh, regarding case study one, did the assessment include consideration for pipe erosion and wall thickness reduction over time? Uh, yes, so when you look at the full paper, which is, uh, uh, I think it's an OMC paper, so you could uh, find it if you search for it. We did the first part of that was to look at the erosion analysis through life and predict what the erosion was up to that point and then also predict whether after changing operating conditions the uh, subsequent erosion rates would be uh, you know still within the allowable limits. Um, for the purposes of this of the spool um, there was no significant erosion in the spool uh, as such and so it was deemed that necessary to uh, actually change the structure configuration to reflect this. So the, okay, the, it's, probably, it's probably cladding loss, but not actual uh, school material loss. Right, I'm going I'm to keep rattling through these because they're coming in thick and fast. So uh, we'll, I'm just going to keep going. Uh, CFD simulations uh, that you've shown use LES, large eddy simulation approaches, computationally very expensive. Are there any ways of simplifying that approach without the LES using uh, more conventional steady state approaches? Um, no. If, if you want to get your spectral content of your forcing, you generally have to predict the large energy containing eddies at least and, and their interaction. So using some kind of scale resolving simulation is a bare minimum. So whether it's LES or DES or some other emerging um, scale adaptive uh, and sorry, scale resolving simulation methods, you certainly need to be able to simulate those edits explicitly. So uh, there were some, a few questions around this. So we will typically uh, use uh, DES for most of our analysis. Uh, so not necessarily resolving all the way to the wall, all the eddies all the way to the wall, but focusing on the large detached uh, eddies. 
uh, and then uh, using range model, the smaller subgrid edges will uh, also try and uh, basically uh, statistically analyze our, uh, our our field, our turbulence field, and make sure that we're resolving at least about 85% of the turbulent kinetic energy. So it, it can be expensive, uh, but we find that with uh, DES somewhat reduces that uh, approach if you end up sort of try and resolve uh, things that are at, at a, a very small length scale and time scale that's not really relevant to, to what you're assessing. Yeah, well, that's related to, to another question in case study one. What was the dominant range of for, forcing frequency? Did we check the cell refinement was adequate to model the turbulence methods and predict the forcing frequency correctly? And what was the liquid gas yes. ratio? There's quite a few questions there. So, yes. Uh, yes. yes. Yeah, so yeah, it was quite a low liquid ratio in this case. I think it was... Uh, if I recall correctly, it was over 90% gas. So in this case, we opted not to uh, explicitly uh, model the liquid, but treat the gas as a, you know, a sort of account for the mixture density in, in, in the gas properties. Um, in terms of simulating the, the turbulence, yes, we did use... Uh, Bruce? Um. Apologies, everyone. I don't know whether everyone else has lost Bruce completely, but... Uh, Hello, sorry, Bruce. sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, sorry. Yes, you dropped off completely. Yes. Sorry about that, I dropped off for a second. <laughs> yeah, in terms of turbulence modeling, yes, we did do... Uh, we, started, we generally start off with a base grid, but then, yes, you do have to refine that grid to make sure that you're resolving uh, a certain minimum proportion of your turbulence kinetic energy, and, and that's something you sort of have to do a precursor simulation for, then statistically analyze your solution and look at what your resolved versus subgrid subgrid kinetic energy is. And in our case, we, we did this until we had a grid that basically gave us about 85% percent, 85 to 90% of our subgrid kinetic energy as being resolved, certainly in the critical locations. Um, in terms of uh, frequency range, we then had about uh, zero. It was about... Um, up to up to 100 hertz. So by the time you go to 100 hertz and beyond, you are now tailing up to a significantly uh, much lower turbulence forcing. So the dominant range was about uh, zero to 100 hertz uh, for that case. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, have we considered fatigue loading from sympathetic deformation and loading as a result of the structure the pipes are attached? So not just the pipe itself, but also the associated structure. Um, not in this instance, so um, what, what, what we tend to do in most instances is to basically assume quite a firm uh, sort of, uh, so we, we do include the support structures when necessary uh, and then account for the stiffness of those support structures, but not for the actual deformation of the, say, the ground that, that, that the support structures would be attached to, which I think is what the question is sort of uh, hinting at. But there's nothing to to stop us from doing that if uh, if we understand what the, uh, the the descriptive function of that of that deformation is. Right um, now it's twelve fifty nine already. Unfortunately, we've cut off at one o'clock. There are just so many questions here. I'm trying to pick out the uh, common themes. Um, so we do have email addresses, so we'll try and uh, respond. Uh, beyond that, one question, is there any industry practice codified guidelines beyond the EI guidance that cover the level three assessment? So are there any guidance for, for this other that, that goes beyond the EI statement? Um, not as, as I, so there's stuff like aircraft, duck, which there's general guidance, you know, for CFD and FEA, but not specific guidance for FIV, uh, certainly not to, not to the same extent that extent as what you have in say some of the erosion standards where this outline quite a clear um, uh, analysis approach and so maybe this is something that might be uh, explored in future. The, the, the EI does sort of broadly recommend what analysis methods are relevant to what mechanisms but, but doesn't really go much beyond that. Okay, thank you, Bruce. I'm afraid we're going to have to stop there. We do have a lot more questions to go. People have provided email addresses with their questions, so we'll pass those on to our speaker today. I'd like to thank Bruce very much for his time and effort putting this together. Absolutely fascinating. Great numbers today. And uh, please remember, there are plenty more free webinars available via the iMechE website coming up. Please sign up for as many as you can. It's been a pleasure having you today.
thank you very much, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.